Griggs and Sheckley started off as minor characters who were just used to explain the setup for the turret battle. Once done, they died fairly quickly, leaving the players alone to fend off the antlion swarms. We found this left players unsure of their defensive strategies and would force them to visually survey the cavern before setting up defenses. So we made the two characters stronger and had them yell out their state to players and even suggest what openings the players should cover. This gave players extra time to set up a defensive strategy before the antlions arrived. This also let us ratchet up the intensity level by slowly heightening their reaction to the threats. Once we realized this worked, we decided to separate the characters and create an Abbott and Costello style team to do little bits during the downtime the players were using to set up their defenses. We ended up with entertaining character moments that also cued the player on game state and events. Griggs and Shegley's comment about not stepping on the grubs was originally intended for comedic effect and to suggest that, as usual, Gordon Freeman had brought trouble in his wake. However, we found that some players took this comment too literally and would spend the rest of the level avoiding grubs in fear of spawning more antlions. We experimented for a short time with making this an actual mechanic, bringing in antlions whenever grubs are squished, but this had several negative results. It made the tunnels far too difficult and canceled out any benefit the player got from squishing grubs for health. We decided to keep the grub behavior simple and rewarding. The breach is a rough earthen tunnel which many playtesters tended not to notice when the attack began. They felt they had been told to defend only the three marked tunnel openings. We addressed this confusion by changing the sequence of antlion waves so that the second attack came through the breach. Players then understood that all four openings were vulnerable. We experimented a lot with the ammunition for this level. Originally we had a single ammo crate containing some machine gun bullets positioned down near the elevator. Playtesters however seemed happy using the shotgun in this battle, so we added a crate full of shotgun shells and moved both crates to the top area, so players could easily trade off between different styles of gunplay. In Half-Life 2 and Episode 1, players learned that turrets will always attack them, unless they are reprogrammed by allies. We needed a new visual way to instantly show that these new turrets are also allies, and decided to hark back to the aircraft nose art of World War II. The elaborate turret design also hints at how bored Griggs and Sheckley must have been sitting down here by themselves. The turret battle design went through many changes. Early stages had the player controlling three turrets and not ever having to fight antlions directly. After playtesters complained of not having anything to do during the battles, we changed the number of turrets to leave the player underhanded, when in later rounds all the tunnels are active. This creates a better mix of resource management and combat. Later, we added this tweaked version of the hopper mines to give players yet another tool for fighting the onslaught. At the climax of the turret battle, we introduced the Vortigaunt in full-on action mode. The player can and should take part in the battle, but we were very careful to make it fairly easy for him to hang back and enjoy watching the forts clear the room of antlions. We wanted to show off the Vortigaunt's new abilities and get the player excited about the role they were going to play as active allies in the struggle against the Combine. In Half-Life 2, Lou Gossett's voice lent itself to a mystical and mysterious characterization of the Vortigaunt. In Tony Todd's reading for Episode 2, we heard new possibilities for a Vortigaunt who's more of a mystic martial artist. With new attack animations and companion behavior, we worked with Tony to build the Vortigaunt into a powerful ally, a full-on alien ass-kicker. Every Half-Life game so far has started with Gordon Freeman weaponless. Assuming some players had just played through Episode 1, while others might not have played it at all, we had to decide how long we should spend parceling out new weapons and providing adequate time to player practice with each one. In this case, we decided to hand the player a number of weapons all at once, figuring most would have mastered their gunplay in previous episodes. We held off doing a lot of deliberate training until we began introducing newer modes of combat later in the episode. Yes, boy. In the prototype for this level, the Vortigaunt cleared the way by blasting apart a rock pile. After a new model was created for the generator, 
We decided to exploit the Vortigaunt's natural relationship with electricity by having him charge the generator much the way he charges Gordon's suit. We were then able to use generators as Vorta gates throughout the level to indicate areas the player could only enter with the Vortigaunt's assistance. One of the three main themes for Antline areas, the mines were a plausible setting for light sources, mechanical obstacles, and resupply. Visually, the mines offer good contrast to the natural cave areas and the more organic spaces the worker ant lines have carved out with acid secretions. The ant line web sacks, grubs, and workers show off a new illumination shader we developed especially for this level. We began with concept art for the web sacks, modeled those, then added the material parameter that allows the model's self-illumination to be modified based on the angle at which the player views them. The end result is an object that looks lit from within by a weird volumetric light. We wanted players to work cooperatively with the Vortigaunt just like they did with Alex in Episode 1. We didn't want to make the Vortigaunt too powerful or he might take away from the player's fun, but we also wanted him to be a good ally to have around. One solution, shown in this scene, was a shock attack where the Vortigaunt would stun a group of antlions so that the player could finish them off. The antlion experience in Half-Life 2 was characterized by a mindless, constant onslaught of bugs rushing your way. We devised the antlion worker for Episode 2 as a way to add depth and variety to the underground sequences by leveraging new types of gameplay. Unlike normal antlions, the worker chooses to avoid direct confrontation, skulking in the background and lobbing acidic globs from a distance. This extends the amount of time players spend with each creature. By contrast, an encounter with an ordinary antlion is over in seconds. The spitting behavior was derived from the bull squid of Half-Life 1, but was updated to fit the more physical world of Half-Life 2. To that end, the spit globs are not merely sprites, but physically simulated objects, flying through the air along realistic trajectories. This cave was originally designed with a pit in the middle, so the player could pump outlines into it with a gravity gun. In playtest sessions, however, very few of our playtesters actually used it in this way. The pit stayed in the room, but we changed the path to allow the player to descend into it and come back out. Texturing of these caves provided a couple of significant challenges. We had never made such a large scale area completely out of displacements before. The convoluted topology of the surfaces made them especially hard to UV map without unpleasant looking scenes and texture warping. After some early attempts, we decided that we were not going to be able to map this area using conventional UV mapping. So we decided to write custom shaders, especially for the caves. Our custom shader combines multiple axis aligned projections based upon the surface mode. This largely fixed our problems with stretching and seams. Since we wanted to provide dramatic lighting in these areas, particularly when lit by the flashlight, we augmented the source engine's radiosity bump mapping with a new piece of technology. This allowed us to create a form of bump maps in which the bump map surface details actually cast soft shadows across the surface. This emphasizes the surface bumpiness, especially when the light is at grazing angles. Turning the Vortigon into an expressive character was a challenge for animators, given that he doesn't have what you call a traditional face. To bring out his personality, the animators concentrate on shifting body weight and broad hand gestures. Most importantly, where human characters tend to move their heads a lot for emphasis, we concentrate his performances on expressive spinal motions. Wherever possible, we try to mine our robust physics engine as a source of novel puzzles. It's especially valuable for giving realistic feedback to the player solving the puzzle. In this scenario, we design the elevator to sink slightly whenever the player steps on it, giving instant intuitive feedback that it reacts to weight. This made it far more likely that the player would understand that he was dealing with a counterweight puzzle. We like to lull players into a trance, then startle them. Here, we convince players they are expected to explore and solve puzzles for a long time. Then we abruptly change the mode of gameplay by throwing grenade lobbing zombines at them. Whenever possible, we try to give the player a glimpse of their eventual goal, even before they realize it is their goal. While we try to design such moments intentionally, sometimes the opportunities present themselves. In this case, while setting up the gag where the rail car slides into the abyss, we opened a hole in the wall and discovered a view of the distant thumper. It became clear that we could tailor the view across the giant cave 
to foreshadow the spot where Gordon would eventually end up. The Vorticon's dispel attack is a radial explosion that takes out a swarm of antlions. It looks most impressive when seen from above, but that's not a perspective the player gets very often in the tunnels. We designed the exit from this battle purely to give the player a view from above so the Vor could put on a show. Originally, this room came directly after a long stretch of combat with antlions and opened up into more of the same. Players who opened the door were faced with another swarm, which they were expected to clear with a whole bunch of handy grenades. However, most playtesters were fairly tired of antlion combat at this point, so we decided that a complete break from antlions would be an even better alternative to blowing up more of them with grenades. of the antlion guarding in this level sets up anticipation for the more extended confrontation in upcoming areas. The player needs to know what he's getting into so that the Vortigon's warnings will all make sense. For most of this episode's development, there was a counterweight puzzle in this area, one the player had to solve while under attack by antlions. Although it was a clever puzzle, we felt the underground experience was already long enough, so we removed it and streamlined the path to the nectar. Having too many obstacles made it hard to keep up the sense that recovering the nectar was an urgent task. Until we added the wooden landing here, players were very reluctant to jump down into the elevator shaft. Some playtesters went all the way back to the previous level looking for another way down. In the days of Half-Life 1, we depended on players jumping willy-nilly down every elevator shaft they encountered. But over the years, they've learned to be afraid of the things we tend to put down there. One of the major graphical enhancements we made to the Source Engine for Episode 2 was the addition of shadow mapping for the player's flashlight. This allows the flashlight to cast soft, dynamic shadows into the world, adding realism and drama to the scene, particularly in dark underground areas like this one, in which the use of the flashlight is required to navigate the space. As you move around, notice that all objects in the world cast and receive realistic shadows from your flashlight. Early versions of this area had serious problems. It was brutally punishing and unfun. We were trying to make an experience about timing and tension, but playtesters perceived this as another boss battle. But without physics and explosives, there's no way to kill the Guardian. They would empty all their ammunition into him and die horribly over and over before giving up and running away. They hated it. Our first solution to this problem was to add an arena immediately before the maze, where we hoped players would use up most of their ammo and on head crabs and barnacles and not even try to shoot them. But clever players managed to lure the head crabs into barnacles and rush past while the barnacles were feeding, arriving in the guardian's lair with plenty of ammunition and again, the false impression that they could kill the boss. In the end, it was necessary to have the Vortigaunt tell the player, remember, do not kill the guardian or the extract will be ruined. Therefore justifying why you wouldn't be able to do what we didn't want you to do and what you couldn't do in the first place. This area is really fun now. The battle is almost exactly like the original layout. The big difference is that we're communicating our expectations to the player, rather than having them learn by dying. In Half-Life 2, the Antlion Guard was originally meant to be a sort of super bug bloodhound that pursued the player through caverns and harassed him while he slipped into small spaces to hide. While we never realized that design in Half-Life 2, this scenario is, for the most part, exactly what his original design sought to accomplish. Over the course of many years of production, on various titles, we found that ideas often go away into the ether for years or more, only to resurface and thrive in a new game environment. Even failed prototypes can flourish down the road. Before we simplified the path through the Guardian's lair, we allowed a right turn at this junction, leading the player right back to where they began. One of our playtesters continued to repeatedly turn right here for half an hour. That was a compelling argument for removing the maze-like elements. The antlion tunnels, carved out by worker antlions using their acid secretions, make up the third of three subterranean spaces with a distinctive visual style man-made mines and natural cave formations being the other two. The presence of crawl spaces was dictated by game design, but they evolved into chambers that fit logically within the life cycle of the antlions. Here, the young grubs can develop and feed in safety, although, conveniently for the player, 
They cannot digest useful items such as health kits. One change we made to episode 2 was to decouple the flashlight power from the suit power. Playtesters constantly had their flashlight on during the guard chase sequence and were unable to sprint to safety because the flashlight drained their suit's sprint ability. We wanted players to be able to outrun the Guardian with their flashlight shining. Sometimes we are forced to make trade-offs between conventions we've established in earlier installments and gameplay we need now. It would be silly to not have cool looking underground passages just to keep flashlight behavior consistent until the end of time. As for the rationale within the story, players might assume this new feature was apparently the result of damage sustained in the train crash. In early versions of this map, the tunnels here were more maze-like with branches, loopbacks, and dead ends. After watching numerous playtesters get lost, it became obvious that they were not having fun. We simplified the paths and added a number of one-way choke points. The curving tunnels still keep the player in suspense, but as long as he keeps moving, he'll continue to progress, with very little time wasted in retracing steps. In this scene, we wanted the player to feel under tremendous pressure to break through the boards. Ideally, they just barely make it through the opening before the Guardian arrives. To get this effect consistently, we had to reduce the number of boards again and again until we saw playtesters consistently scrambling to safety at the last moment. In early versions of this map, the player was allowed to drop straight to the bottom of the shaft. Nobody ever saw the Guardian break through the boards. Therefore, we added a small floor area and required the player to turn around to break more boards, making it much likelier that players would see the Guardian's attack. One of our toughest jobs is tuning for difficulty. There are all kinds of ways that sloppy game design can make players miserable when they're supposed to be enjoying themselves. If the player is laughing as he dies, it's a good sign. It means that death is perceived as part of the entertainment experience, that the player died fairly and not as a result of poor design. But if the playtester is beating his head on the keyboard, we usually take this as a sign that there's still work to be done. At various times in development, this gear was loose in the environment, tucked in a dark crevice, hidden in a small box, or lost in the bottom of a flooded pool. One playtester, unaware of his low health, actually drowned in two feet of water while retrieving the gear. We realized that attaching the gear to a chassis identical to the engine motor was the best way to help the player make the connection between this gear and the empty space on the other assembly. This puzzle proved surprisingly difficult for many players. In an earlier version, not only did you need to find the spare gear, but this elevator was connected to a disabled generator that wouldn't operate until you also attached a crank and jump-started it with the gravity gun. Although it sounds simple, most playtesters got stuck here for many minutes. We kept simplifying until we hit the version you see here. We had wanted to implement a generalized particle system for quite some time, and after episode 1 we set out to create one. In previous Half-Life games, each effect had been hand-coded by a programmer working with an artist. It was effective, but not easily scalable. Our new system drew upon the aspects we found most useful from team members who had worked with both real-time systems in games and offline renderers for movies such as The Lord of the Rings. The results were an artist-friendly, modular, component-driven system. Each system can have renderers which display the particle in some form, initializers which set up certain properties of the particle, operators which carry out actions upon the particle each frame, Constraints, which provide movement limitations such as collision, forces which impart complex dynamics, and emitters which determine how each new particle is created. Together they are plugged into a system as needed, to be as lightweight or as complex as required for the effect. Each individual component is simple, but when combined can create rather complex dynamics. Furthermore, adding additional components to support the specific needs of a game or a mod is easily done. The results can be seen in everything ranging from the simple glows of the larval extract here, to the citadel effects, blood, smoke, hunter effects, portal effects, fire, and so forth. Dynamic effects are now in the hands of the artists, who can use them to create whatever is needed, from unique one-offs in specific levels, to generalized effects for gameplay. When the Vorticant discovers the extract, we wanted to do something to distinguish the nectar from all the other glowy alien substances that we've seen in the caves so far. Therefore, we had him perform a bit of a chant, and had the extract give off a show of its own. One of the most significant story meetings we had near the beginning of episode 2 concerned how much we were going to reveal about the G-Man. 
Once we decided exactly how much to explain, we had to come up with a way of revealing it. Alex's healing sequence offered the perfect way to pull Gordon out of mundane surroundings and put him in a realm where the G-Man can speak to him directly, but dialogue is only one of our tools for narrative. By blending images from the past, the present, and the immediate future, we continue to stitch together the Half-Life story over time. We make clear that the events at Black Mesa continue to resonate, and we draw the strongest connections yet between Gordon, the G-Man, and Alex and Eli Vance. We sometimes use sounds to set a mood rather than to literally underscore the on-screen action. The G-Man sequence you just saw, for example, relies heavily on the use of abstract and ambient sounds. We wanted the soundscape to have a deadened, internalized quality that you get from putting your hands over your ears. So we started with recordings from inside the womb. If you listen closely, you can hear the internal gurgling noises as well as muffled heartbeats. We then added various other effects around the rhythm of the heartbeat, plus long-tailed reverbs. None of the door or transition effects are literal interpretations, but are obscure metal and feedback sounds created to work in sync with the observable actions. So all of these things contribute to the scene's dreamlike quality. I really consider yeah. working on Alex Stiff. my okay. acting school because okay. um, it has stretched me. It has made me go deeper in my work. It's sharpened me up as far as being able to call in emotions or, or really just imagination. A creative spirit is really just a lot of imagination, I think. And afterwards, I always seem to be sharper in everything I do. I always have, have a good show at night or I always go on to the next job with, with a heightened awareness or a heightened presence. And it's only helped me. So thank you, Alex, for that. 